it's a really a great pleasure uh, to bring uh, our previous work to this workshop. Um, and uh, uh, this work is like, as you can see, uh, talking about like a super heavy dark matter. So like say way beyond uh, the TV range that people have like addressed about like uh, in the previous few talks. Um, and the, so I would apologize if I just stuck somewhere or I have, I'm not clear minded because this is not the best time of the day to give a talk right here. Um, so the talk would be based on the previous two uh, works uh, with uh, Professor Yi Wong's group uh, back in Hong Kong University of Science and Tech, also with my uh, uh, postdoc collaborator, uh, Tohiro Nakama, and also a bunch of uh, PhD students. Some of them are postdoc also right now. Uh, Chan Man So, uh, uh, Si Jo, uh, who is like uh, in, in Kobe right now, and also uh, Shu Yun Lu. So, here is just a, a big panorama. So uh, I, I'm pretty sure that there are so many models, right? I mean, uh, previous speakers are uh, mostly focusing on the WIMP scenario. Um, though here WIMP, I mean, just like something that's have like a weekly, uh, that like 10 to the minus 26 uh, uh, annihilation cross section and the thermal history that they freeze out. Uh, more or less they falls into this poor park. And of course there are like so many other options. I'm pretty sure that every pixel would be uh, just already uh, covered here. But here I'm talking about uh, the Wimzillas or something like a super heavy dark matter that's uh, of order 10 to the 10 uh, GeV, roughly speaking. So you may refer this uh, or relay this with inflationary scale. Uh, that's uh, very different from uh, the thermal history. Uh, that that we are supposed to study. Now, beyond that, you only have like a PBH perhaps uh, as the dark matter candidate. So uh, it's an interesting name uh, called Wimzilla. It basically is a Godzilla of the WIMS. So uh, it's of enormous size. Uh, it's interesting, but here I will just interchangeably use the, the word like a super heavy dark matter or Wimzilla. So the production of such a very massive particles of uh, you need a, like a relevant scale, right? I mean, for, for example, at, uh, for WIMPs, you need the thermal bath, like say hot enough um, so they can dump their energy and then just eventually decay. But at the, it, at the very beginning, they're in thermal equilibrium with everything. So the temperature is high enough. So for these very heavy dark matter, um, the thermal production is no longer valid because you, you cannot even prove the... the, the um, the radiation domination can exist at that moment, but it is very attempting to relate this concept with inflation because we um, there's nothing against us to think about a, a, a high scale of inflation. So the production would be via gravity during the inflation or like the, at the end of the inflation during that transition uh, to like a, either a matter domination or radiation domination. So the production rate uh, is very characteristic. People have like studied this uh, super heavy dark matter production for a while, but we we believe that we have a much better um, mathematical approach that gives you similar analytical results. So uh, roughly speaking for very light fields, so if these are still lighter than uh, the Hubble, or, I mean, of the, the time of inflation, then uh, the number that you get, like say, you know, the number density is like satiated. So it's like, say, it doesn't matter the mass, it's mass independent. It's just like, say, fill up every Hubble patch. Or you can imagine if you are heavy, then you are somehow like, say, thermal suppressed uh, because th these are heavy. So you need to pay for exponential suppression. But usually this exponential factor, factor only uh, calculated, like, say, in a brute force way. Uh, for example, uh, in, in some super, uh, uh, WKB approximation, and they do a lot of numerical work, but usually uh, it converges not very well, and you have like a lot of fluctuations because the, the integration is not very stable. Yeah, it's like a fast oscillating behavior. So here, um, ignoring all these details, uh, let's begin with the simplest super heavy dark matter, which is just a scalar with a minimal uh, not necessarily minimal, but uh, minimal coupling makes life easier, uh, such couplings. So you can see it's basically itself, right? I mean, it's the standard uh, canonical uh, kinetic term and also its mass. That's it. Uh, it's Z2 protected, so it's stable. It has, it doesn't couple to anything else. Uh, later, I will set this zeta, I mean, side to zero, so it doesn't really have uh, non-trivial uh, 
gravitational coupling. So the equation of motion can be easily written like this. It's it's trivial. And then we quantize a different mode. So therefore, uh, you can just like different K modes would uh, behave differently. So the, the primary goal is to uh, just predict uh, the amplitude of each K mode, the, uh, or you can say, uh, the coefficients of these k-modes, and then you get uh, from starting the inspiration from the beginning, or like say some deep in the de Sitter space, and the well, I mean till the inflation ends. So if this is like the equation of motion uh, that we talk about, like for each mode, and then if you look at the equation itself, it looks like the tunneling uh, problem. Like say it's just like say you get through a, a potential barrier that's uh, like this. Um, so it's like a very complicated, but you have a background cosmology, then this is like a, basically a barrier. And anything that can penetrate through, uh, basically the barrier is created at the end of the inflation uh, would be the dark matter. And uh, here I will also need to introduce, this is necessary, uh, though maybe redundant, this is effectively the dark matter mass. Right? It's a little bit complicated, but let's set this side to zero. Then as long as M, the dark matter mass is greater than 1.5, the, the um, the Hubble Hubble scale. That's how we referring this heavy field uh, or heavy field super heavy dark matter. Uh, then this is essentially a dimensionless uh, effective mass. And then doing uh, some complicated math. Uh, for example, you can just like uh, starting from this uh, standard uh, vacuum solutions uh, during uh, the, the inflationary time. And then uh, by doing this Bogolubov transformation, uh, eventually you will find out the dark matter production. Uh, are actually related to the beta uh, squared right here. So the beta is actually just the amplitude of the mode that's coming out, or you can find asymptotically uh, at the end of the inflation. So we find out, like say, using uh, the method or technique called Stokes, uh, Stokes line. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have much time to introduce. It's very tricky uh, mathematically. But during that, uh, with that, um, uh, trick, or you can say uh, technique, and also combined with a semi-analytical uh, or basically analytical toy model of our universe, uh, it's the smooth transition between uh, a de Sitter space and also the Minkowski universe. So basically, uh, a Minkowski universe is an approximation of uh, radiation domination. And in this way, the background, uh, the space-time is analytical. Uh, so you can expand it to the uh, um, say complex time axis, it it's works totally fine. And by this, we can just have very nice semi-analytical approach uh, of the prediction of the this beta or the amplitude with different k. So you can see that in the small k limit where the dark matter is produced deeply in the decisive space, it uh, the numerical solution matches with the de Sitter solution right here. And then you can see that uh, the only thing that matters is the uh, exponential vector right here. So it looks like, well, I mean, it's e to the pi mu, uh, or like say, if in terms of number, e to the two pi mu. So you can imagine it's the inflationary def determines uh, a, a scale and it determines a temperature, right? I mean, just uh, the standard practice. And then in this thermal bath that's created by gravity, or like say it's hawking radiation of the uh, inflationary uh, horizon, uh, then you get a bunch of uh, dark matter, of course, paying another uh, exponential factor. But it's now analytical. And from the numerical integration, you see a perfect match with uh, this equation. So that's very nice. So this mechanism actually buys sufficient dark matter uh, production. Uh, so given uh, a realistic uh, inflationary Hubble scale and also the heating uh, temperature, these like say depend on the model, like say as you want. But uh, for the wide range of uh, dark matter, even in this smooth transition case, you can have like uh, just right amount of dark matter. And uh, I mean, they survive the current bound of the inflationary scale. Of course, I have to mention here, here I, we only care about or like say calculate um, the case of the most pessimis pessimistic way. So the transition is absolutely smooth. So no extra production of dark matter. And also the dark matter uh, population is uh, maximally diluted, if you want to say. So definitely there could be more dark matter production uh, if you uh, turn on 
uh, like say other mechanisms or like say a, a alternative uh, background space time. So here I'm just finishing the part of like say it's production. It's kind of standard. We did like uh, mathematically addressing this so make it nicer, uh, but it's definitely there. So another key question is, if it's there, then how can we observe? Because this is like so heavy. So this scalar may have something to do itself with uh, in, uh, some very high scale physics, but uh, definitely not standard model, or at least it's very hard to get. They are so uh, so heavy and uh, uh, from from indirect detection, for example, it's, there's like no, no, no much ground you can find them, nor as you can directly produce from the, from the lab. But fortunately, uh, the energy of that uh, dark matter production mechanism do show up once. That's uh, the inflation itself. So uh, this, like, uh, the idea brings the idea of like cosmological collider physics. That the cosmology actually tells us something about the well. I mean, the information about the dark matter via CMB or large scale structure. Um, the idea is very simple. So it's uh, it was originally proposed by uh, these people. Uh, you can see, uh, well, a bunch of cosmological collider uh, paper uh, that at the very beginning, you are creating something very strong, uh, just like a very energetic, for example, at the LXC, you have uh, the beams colliding at each other. And then uh, at a very small scale, some hard scattering uh, or hard process uh, forms. And then as time goes by, or like say at the LXC, the particle or any collider, a particle just flies out um, at a very longer distance. Okay, so uh, much longer time goes or the, the energy scale becomes lower, you'll find particles, right? You project your particles to a plane or like say a, a bulk of, of many planes and then you'll find correlations of particles. For example, a jet is like a bunch of hadrons that have like a very strong angular correlations with like a small angular scale. So here is this, the same thing, you project your uh, modes of that matter on CMB, right? Of different uh, of different types of uh, signals. For example, curvature, isocurvature. So, uh, one of the most interesting case, uh, or uh, or like essentially uh, defines the cosmological collider uh, physics is the squeeze limit non Gaussianity, uh, because if uh, there's no interaction, then everyone becomes like say all these. Uh, dark matter uh, interactions become plane waves. They just pass each other and uh, just say hi to everyone. So no non-trivial interaction or no non-trivial uh, signal you can observe. But you can see that uh, if you observe the three-point correlation, for example, uh, just the, you can say it's a temperature uh, from CMB or anything else, uh, and then you arrange the, just do a Fourier transform and uh, do this squeeze limit. So two of them becomes more uh, energetic or like say higher uh, momentum than the three. So this reminds us this is like a heavy particle decay in in uh, in particle physics. And indeed, it is. Uh, the the idea is very simple uh, and very similar. I mean, so you can find invariant mass term. So basically, the mu show up in this kinetic term. So you can actually find out by reading uh, the shape of the non Gaussianity and also the angular dependence. But this one is less interesting because it's like more or less trivial for the scalar. Ring fine. Sorry, yes. we are a little overdue for presentations. So could you wrap up your uh, talk, sorry? Minutes? Yeah. Uh, maybe uh, it's already done, but one minute is OK for us. OK, one minute. OK, so OK, cool. Yeah. So you can see this auditory uh, 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 patterns. But unfortunately, in our original model, uh, this Planck is suppressed by so many powers of Planck scale. So we need to introduce the interaction of these. Sorry, I have to switch, like say, using sigma, right? Basically, dark matter and a lot of light field. So let, let me just su summarize. So there's like two scenarios. I have two slides. Over. Anyways, uh, it's the curvaton that um, these dark fields, like say light fields, eventually, it, I mean, it creates some pattern. It memorize uh, these non-Gauss entity. And then it rejects or decay back to the radiation. So you can see the three-point correlation of curvature is actually by carried by these uh, dark uh, components, and then uh, also with this uh, ratio. And uh, we show that uh, in this red uh, shaded region that you have enough dark matter, uh, you can actually have indeed, uh, if the coupling is not small, not too small, you have like a reasonable uh, observational effect in the future.
you can also have isocurvature collider uh, that uh, these light fields modulate the dark matter uh, mass, and that therefore it creates the isocurvature mode uh, in non gaussianity in isocurvature mode, uh, like in terms of dark matter over density. And uh, you can, we have the limits right here. So here's the summary. Uh, just I will stop here, uh, ready for the question.